So we are in the second leg of our journey here in Oregon, and we've come out to the mountains, and we're actually hanging out with uh, Bruiser, and I will let him introduce himself. Uh, right now, guys are getting ballistic stuff set up. He's gonna talk us through some long range, so this is one of the things I said I've been wanting to dive into this year, shooting more medium to long range, especially with, with ARs, um, just because that's like my main rifle, and that's something that I want to, you know, grow my skill set on outside of shooting of like 100 yards and in. Um, so uh, we decided while we're out here, let's get out with Bruiser and get some uh, some learned it going. But yeah, I'll let, I'll let him introduce himself, and then you guys will come along for the journey. Hi, I'm Joe Dawson with Bruiser Industries, kind of half of the equation rather. Uh, there's me, myself, and my business partner, JR, down in LA. Uh, I did 14 years in the SEAL teams. Uh, typically, you guys can follow me at, at Bruiser Industries or, the, uh, or at Bruiser Joe is kind of my personal page. Follow either one. The, uh, we typically specialize in kind of scoped carbine, precision rifle type stuff. Obviously, both we also do pistol, carbine, all that kind of stuff. Today, we're out here with the average Joe's guys doing some scoped rifle, rifle and precision, precision rifle type work. If you guys have any questions, whatever, obviously hit us up and uh, we'll have our calendar posted for 2023. Uh, coming up soon at bruiserindustries.com. So why does this matter? Why do we put in stuff in, in the um, ballistic calculator? Why do we put stuff in a Kestrel? Why do we uh, have to put in all this information to determine your, your trajectory over distance? So what you guys have to think about is, especially, I just did a class the other day on, on the, I called it the rise of the riser, how everybody gets these optics farther and farther, like higher, and they, people wanna treat scopes like they're red dots. And so you bring that zero in, and what you do is you have this converging angle that gets, uh, it gets a greater angle to where the convergence is between your line of sight and the trajectory of the bullet. And the greater that angle gets, the higher you're going to have a max word. So how do we, when we dial for distance, all you're doing is you're dialing down the reticle, which is going to elevate your barrel to a given equation that the ballistic calculator is giving you so that when the bullet comes back down, you're impacting where you want. So there's two different ballistic coefficients we use. A ballistic coefficient is literally just a number that is assigned to a bullets, uh, the bullets design rather. And it's basically its ability to, its efficiency through the air. So using a drag scale, which is basically like the, the bullets ability to, with to sustain momentum. So a BC of a tipped match king right here, 175, you got a G1 of 545. Typically what we use, you'll see guys, you guys will see G1 and G7. G1 is typically, what it is, is you're, it's a comparison against a base. What the base is, is it's a, it's a bullet design used for the, whatever the mad scientists are that develop, you know, the, aer the aeronautical engineers that do all this stuff. The G1 was developed a long time ago when bullets used to look like everything out of a 30-30, a 30-06, they all used to look like, like a 115 looks like. Flat bottom, smooth sides, rounded top. So when you compare against a, any bullet against a G1 and you have a boat tail hollow point, the, the ballistic coefficient is going to be higher. When you compare against a G7, if you look at the G7 model that you're comparing it to, it's actually a boat tail hollow point. And so you're comparing like for like. And so if you ever wonder why a G1 BC will be 0.545, but then a G7 BC will be 0.2. Two, one, it's because now you're comparing like for like for the drag scale factor. So you're comparing a, a boat tail hollow point against a boat tail hollow point. So we take that, we put that in there and we, the little, the ballistic calculator, your app, your Kestrel, whatever gives you an equation. And now, now that allows you to adjust the scope for that equation downrange. Now, what happens when you don't have a chronograph? Like that's the thing with ARs, especially people go like, well, I have an AR. I don't have a chronograph. I'm not a long distance shooter, you know, so why would I have a chronograph? It's like, can you still true up your Kestrel to what your gun does? And that's how we get into, and we're going to do that after we verify zeros, we're going to get into truing, which is you, basically you're giving the answer to the calculator and then you're bending the equation to match what the result is. So. Uh, like muzzle velocity, you can go like, hey, you're probably around 2550. Like I swag it. Like, hey, a 16 inch 308, you're probably 2450, 2500, depending on what bullet you're shooting. Start there. You're close enough. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to pick a distance that's, you know, probably 80% of transonic and you're going to go shoot and you draw a line across the target. And you're not worried about windage. We're worried about making sure that your, your elevation is dialed. You're dialing that elevation so you know exactly what it is. Then you're going to go back in your ballistic app and tell it like, hey, I hit at whatever, uh, 6.1 mils. So it's, you're, that way the calculator is now gonna take 6.1 mils and it's gonna bend that arc 
and all of the numbers it has to fit that equation. There's two trains of thoughts in this. People go like, well, if I have a known BC, a known BC, and I have a unknown velocity, I'm a true velocity. But the thing I try to tell people is that, do you really have a known BC? So I, bullets are kind of like supplements or energy drinks. So if you measure that caffeine in that, in that can, and you measure another can, and you measure another can, do you think that every single can would have 120 milligrams of caffeine? No. No, because it's across the batch, right? And so if you take protein powder, it's like, oh, it's 30, 30 grams of protein in a protein shake. Well, it's like, well, yeah, some might have 25, some might have, and every lot, some lot might be really heavy and be 35, and some one lot might be kind of light because you know they, they had somebody who was having a bad case on the Mondays, and now they got a lot that's low. Bullets are the exact same way. And so lot to lot from the same manufacturer, a Hornady 105 might have a 0.221, and they might have a 0.219, then you might have a lot that has a 0.225. So it, but the box might say 0.221. And so when you start tweaking that velocity, that's why people go like, well, hey, I'm hitting at one, two, three, four, five, but then I start losing it at like six, seven, eight. That's a BC thing, not a velocity thing. And so you kind of end up having to do both. And so what I always do is I true velocity. I usually, you can go like, hey, 0.8 of, of uh, uh, transonic. That's usually the number a lot of people use. And then after that, then you start chewing BC. And so what you're, now what you're doing is you're bending that, that arc to one point with velocity, and you're grabbing that point and you're bending the rest of it with BC. And so now your arc's gonna, gonna match a lot better because the velocity, if you're, if you're hitting like, I'm on at one, I'm on at two, I'm on at three, four, five, six, and then it starts leaving, your velocity didn't like fall out of the sky. It's that the model you're giving your ballistic calculator for BC isn't perfect, and that now it's not calculating the, its, uh, its efficiency through the air to get to that given equation downrange. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, you guys can do that on your, on the Kestrels, like he has and I have. You can, there's an actual spot in the Kestrel you can go Cal DSF, which is Cal the drag scale factor, calibrate the drag scale factor and you're actually calibrating the BC. And then, but on the, what you do on the app is what you're gonna do is we're gonna go out there, we're gonna make sure it's zeroed and we're gonna shoot at, you know, a 500 yard target, 400 yard target probably with these little ARs. We're gonna go, hey, hey, we're center mass, center mass, center mass. Okay, cool, you're good at four or 500 yards. Okay, and then we're gonna go shoot the 650 or 700 target. And then we're gonna, if you're off that any, by any, we're gonna then cal the BC. And so all you have to do then is you just go into, hey, if I'm not hitting where I want to, it's like I had to dial five mils. Okay, so you're gonna change the muzzle velocity in your app for that bullet until it matches. That's all you're gonna do. The Kestrel just has an automatic point where you can go, hey, at this distance, I hit with this dope and it does it all for you. All you have to do it manually is just keep modifying the velocity a little bit until it says, hey, at 225 or 450, I was supposed to hit with this, I hit with that. Now that muzzle velocity is good. Now I don't fuck with the muzzle velocity anymore. Then we'll shoot at 650 or we'll move back and we'll shoot at eight with the 308s. And then, then what we're gonna do is see if you guys are off again, then we're gonna tweak that BC slightly. And you guys will see that the, the dope up front doesn't change. It's how it maintains past that kind of halfway point is what really what you're gonna affect. Cool. Cool? So, uh, Jimmy, for the viewers, um, you're gonna wanna go back, you're gonna wanna screen record that because if you want that information again, that's gonna cost you a lot of money from an instructor or you're gonna spend a long time figuring out chewing data for a very long time between matches and matches and matches. That was the best description of chewing data in that short amount of time I've heard. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna put, Jimmy today is gonna shoot my 13.9. We got a bunch of other guns here. Um, yeah, we'll get after it. The cheek Jimmy, the only thing I do like more about the, the attacker this one? is that yep. fine Push center. Center dot, exactly, down. yes. Because I love my Vortex, the one at 10. I love it. And the yeah. uh, buttstock length, length of pull is the same. Okay. about an inch left, give it a three shot. Preston, you want top or bottom? Uh, I'll take bottom. You say bottom? Yeah, I'm fine okay, with bottom. So, uh, Come back. 
back, Jimmy, uh, two clicks. That's super light. You're on the wrong. Right. Oh yeah. You, you. Oh, I was on one at a time. That was. Price, go ahead and just come down. Uh, four mils, and come left. A mil. Sorry, down four. Down four, left a mil. Jimmy, you're beating up the just right of center. Okay, uh, we right think there. one click. Yeah, oh, maybe. Bottom, right? You said down yeah. point four? No, four, four mils. Oh, four full mils. Yeah, four full mils. You're on my target. Oh, am I? Yep. Uh, that's, uh, that's okay. Ooh, dry fire this real quick. Six. And then come left uh, a mil and a half. One mil and a half. Okay. Yep. Five, five, five. Jimmy, you're right in the right in the white. Okay, one more. Sure. I mean, your last four shots would fit under a quarter. Same. You think I'm good there? Yeah, you're good, man. Okay. Impact. So, I have a loss. This is what happens when I, when I shot a lot of 14 fives. You're just below center, a little, a little right. Okay. So I want you to hold left edge. Okay. Send it. Okay, your your elevation's perfect. That's your dope. Okay. Which plate was he shooting? Uh, far right. Far right? Yep. Which one is that? What's this? There we go. So now you're gonna go, you, what was it, four, 420. Okay. All I gotta do is one round this thing all day. And then make Tyson out of two If I can just go one for one all day, that'd be great. And then you're gonna, we hit with 2.6, 2.5, 2.5. Okay. So you're, you're really, really close with our, okay. Okay, so now, now that that is now true your velocity okay. based off of you hitting at that distance. Okay. So did you see how you high got there? No. So so gun, and you go all the way down to the bottom. Yep. And then cal drag scale factor. Okay. And then click on it. Yep. And then you're going. I, the target I shot is at 420 yards. Yep. And I needed that much to hit it. Okay. Well, uh, did we had 2.6, right? So how do you adjust, how do you do? We're on 2.5. Okay. So so you would just click on it. Uh huh. And go 2.5. Yeah. Then you go exit. Got it. You go accept DSF cal. Yeah. Select. Yes. Okay. Got it. Got it. And then just exit. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So now you should be able to go to to your range card now or anything else. Yeah. And then if if we, you start missing, like we have a 600 yard target out there with a 139. Yeah. We'll we'll swag at it, and then if if we get if you're like, well, dude, it's, it should be it's saying that I need. Whatever, uh, fucking five, yeah. and we're we're shooting at uh, five five to hit. Then uh, we'll we'll do is go back in there and we'll cat. Well, there's another one underneath Cal DSF. Yeah. Oh, you can do. Uh, how's that? We can, we'll do is we'll change the BC. Uh, can you explain what just happened? So Taylor, the PRS champion of Average Joe's, actually just missed a target at a hundred yards. A hundred yards. <laughs> You may go center match again. I saw the hit. Huh? You may go ahead and correct. I'd hold left edge, maybe. All right. Impact center mass, right underneath the bolt. Yeah. Shut his leg off. my ass. So you just yanked it first round or something? No, I, I, I was off center mass so and I went off right edge. It looked like it was like 12 feet to the right. Yeah, that's why we were fucking with him with the video. Yeah. No. Yeah, dude, that was real. I saw that shit. It was right off the edge. So this is. This is why I'm the uh, leader of the Average Joes, because I get on and fuck it up. 
to be fair, I didn't miss either of the two times I shot. I hit it first time. So with a gas gun. With a gas gun. If you knew what you were doing, that'd be better. <laughs> Impact. You couldn't be more center. You're good. Out of four. You don't. Hey, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Woohoo. Uh, come. How'd you feel on that one? Uh, I felt pretty good. I held uh, center, center mass, left edge. Okay. Everybody's nemesis, the tripod. Okay, so this is something that even early in my career, something that was kind of seen, seen as magical. You know, we had, all we really had was the fo photo tripods. And so they just couldn't support the weight. And lately with PRS and, and really right stuff and Vortex and Leo Photo and two vets, you now have tripods that are designed for shooting. They can actually maintain like rifle weight, rifle recoil. They have a wide base. They give us the options that we need for shooting. And so that, and then we also have the rise of, of different types of vices, whether it's the uh, Kampf Jaeger, the, the hog saddle, pig saddle, really right stuff has one. And then the rise of arca rail, which we'll show over here too. But what does this give, give us? There's things that kind of you have to think about as you get up off the ground, like those some fundamentals. If you're giving up stability, if you're giving up those multiple points of support, whether it's the bipod, the rear bag, your body, recoil management, as you get stand up, some of those things go away. So the other things become more important as you give up something else. So there's the couple things you need to think about with tripods that I think people tend to nuke a little bit, which the first thing I always tell people is, is the orientation of the legs. For me, the way how I orient the legs, is if I'm going to be using the space in front of me, like if I can't, if I'm going to be taking a knee, if I need the space directly in front of me, I go leg split because that gives me the room to, to, uh, to maneuver and work, to sit, whatever, without having to fuck with this rear leg. If I'm going to be spread, and I'm supporting the gun, there's a reason why I tend to have the leg backwards. Now, in a high recoil rifle, a 338, something like that, it, it can be less consistent, but if you're actually giving input to the gun, we'll try both of those today. Neither of them I view as wrong, it's just different. And you guys will see. I tend to then use it this way because how I use a sling on a tripod, I like having the center support, and I'll show you guys that. So, leg orientation is a big thing. Uh, height. Height is usually dictated by the, what's the reason you're using a tripod. And so if you're going to, if you can, if you're standing, that usually means you have to shooting out of a window, or, you know, down a ravine, whatever. But if I can get seated or the more support I can give myself, like if I, if I can sit with a bag on my lap and I can create that structure to give the back of the gun less muscular tension to hold it, the better. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use this one as an example, just because it's probably the least stable considering between Arca rail and a clamp. And I'm gonna use this one. Okay, so again, it doesn't really matter. A lot of people tend to use two legs back. Um, shooting with a bag, people tend to get really wrapped up over having clamps or vices or the Arca rail, which is, this gun has on it, but you can do, accomplish a lot with a simple bag. This is a Armageddon gear, the, X, the Schmedium wax nylon uh, game changer. This is probably my preferred one. The, the fact that it has the two big sides allows it to kind of clamp over the top of things. This thing is key. You'll see as we do like the ladder or a fence or a cattle gate, cattle gate or something, even off something like barbed wire, it really, really works well because it can clamp down on either side and give you that huge contact patch for the rifle. Uh, there's a couple ways to think about it. If you can, the farther you can get the gun back, it makes you have a wider base, but the farther you have the gun forward, it gives you things like the magazine and stuff. You can put pressure, more pressure on the gun. So it really has, tend, it depends on if you're kind of a pull or push type shooter. Uh, with, without a, without using a sling or actually, well, I'm not gonna use a sling really with a bag anyways. If I'm using a bag like this, what I'm gonna try to do is try to get support on the front of the gun as far as I can. And the way that I usually compare my stability is I talk about it in wobble. So as I get on that head plate, that's about 250. But what I mean by wobble is how much is the reticle moving left and right or up and down in mils. So this is a mil scope. So 
just sitting here with my hand on this standing in kind of an awkward position of, with how tall I am. I've got less than two tenths of wobble. So if I was to put a mag in this, press into the gun, get downward stability, with that target being about 0.6 wide, I'm on target even with my wobble. So this is probably your least stable of between the rest or the arca rail. If you were to come over here for the arca rail, basically this is what arca rail allows you to do is now the gun is actually physically attached to the tripod. And so now we can start thinking about using things like slings. So this is when I, when I start talking about like how I typically use a sling on a tripod. So what some people do is they attach to their belt, which I have one and I can show you guys how to use that. My thought on it is this, I don't like to be attached to the gun. So like in the places that I've been, if rounds start coming through a window, something starts happening, I don't want to have to try to bait. And they go, well, it's got a QD on it. Well, it's got, yeah, but rounds coming through the window, I'm not typically thinking about like QD. I want to be able to get the fuck away from the gun. And so I t tend to use the belt in the positions between stability. What I mean by that is if I can stand and I'm not maintaining like a you know half squat where I'm super unstable and using a lot of muscle, then I what I'll do is I sling to the to the tripod itself, like a deadlifting strap. And then I can give it tension just by twisting on the leg. And then now, so now instead of having to put my hand way up here, I can loosen this up, get on where I want, tighten it down, and then get that last little movement out, just like that. And now if I want to get off that gun, don't drag it with you. I can do whatever I want. And with the strap, how much wobble do you have right now? Fuck, I mean, it's prone. None. So the in between, what I'm talking about is like, if I have to like be like one of these, like I can't take a knee and I'm kind of like- This is a super awkward position. And that's usually driven by where I'm at, what I'm doing. Like if you're in a stocking field, if you're overseas, if you're in a window, if you're doing an overwatch and you're the, the area you need to see is dictating your position in one of those in-betweens. What I like about this is, The more support you can give yourself, like if you, if I was sitting on a rooftop and I had a wall to lean against, if I had a chair, you know, whatever, obviously it gives you more support, right? So if I get rid of this sling now, What it allows me to do now is I can I can sit back on my belt and it's used as a stop. And if I need to adjust it, some people will actually grab it and kind of do one of these. But now it kind of almost like I'm leaning against a wall, a car, or a chair, or whatever. I'm using the rifle as a stop. Okay. But again, this is one of those things where it's like, yeah, I have a QD, you know, how hard is it to pull away, whatever. But if, if this is a little lower, then I can kind of sit back into the sling like a seat. And then I don't have to like, I can release the tension in my legs. Like I'm not, I'm not, shaky, I'm not flexed out. I'm not doing whatever. The other spot is kind of between kneeling. Like if I can get down here, I can get some support, you know, perfect, great. But what if you're like this? you're in between that position. Like you start trying to stack and you're like, fuck. 
But if that's the visibility you have, then this becomes another option to kind of take up some of that is using this. Other than that, I tend to like using, it's faster, it's easier. I can spin it on, spin it off, reconnect to the rifle, good to go. So I, I keep one of these in my bag for, for like those positions. Um, the other thing that this kind of can come can help with is on a barricade. You clip into the rifle, you can sling up and pull, really pull the gun into you without it being slung around your body. And you can kind of grab the sling and put pressure with your hand. I'll show you guys that over there, but different type of sling. And then the, the leg orientation thing is that I don't necessarily like being cross body. So that's why I tend to, when I shoot standing, especially with lighter caliber guns, like six, six millimeters, five, five, six, whatever. I like standing like this. The other reason is because look at the angle of the sling. It's pulling straight down as opposed to at an angle, right. either direction. And so if, if I can really, I can get really stable, I can stand behind this, loose, loosen this up, get wherever I need to go. Okay, hey, I'm gonna shoot. Okay, that target, check, tighten it down. And then shoot, whatever I need to do. Um, So slings, sling use. Okay, now let's talk about using other things other than a sling. People tend to look at bags. These things, these were like, when these first came out, everybody was like, oh, that's bullshit, that's unrealistic. Oh, you'd never have that overseas. Oh, you know, I, won't, I wouldn't carry that with me. I'm gonna tell you right now what I always had in my bag. Puff gear. Guess what it was always, always sat in? A dry bag, because why? Because I didn't want it to get wet. Guess how, how big it is, usually about this big. So. I always had something that was something that I could be utilized how we use these bags. And I'll show you guys that in a sec. So these bags can be really, it's an easy way that I don't have to have a puff, get, puff jacket with me or Gore-Tex or whatever. But I have this in my operational bag. It just might not be a you know, foam filled bag, uh, but it, you can still use it the same way. So we're gonna take this sucker, put it down to kneeling. The other thing, uh, tripods, did you guys change heights on these things? You guys always want to adjust from the top down. And if, as you're putting them back from the bottom up, because this is the thicker part of the leg. This is the thicker part of the leg. All right, kneeling, some other ways to use bags and all the other things. And this will apply also to, um, people have backpacks. They carry bags with them. What can they be used for? A few things actually. So if I get on a, a height where I have this gun, that one's on one, one, two, one, two. I think it was unstable ground. Nope. Oh, that's why. That Okay, so I'm gonna use this thing for support and I, I'm kind of floating, right? And I'm trying to get something. So how can I fill this gap? A couple ways. You can get the, the bag underneath your arm and try to get that foot flattened out so I can get on the front of the gun. And what it does is it now allows all this muscular tension of me having to hold my body upright, the arm, the gun, everything can now be passed down into my feet and I don't have to try to hold that much tension up. The other thing people can do is, like somebody like Jimmy or something, if you're trying to, or even anybody else, you can put it behind your, you can sit on it and extend that distance in the back. That can also kind of remove some of that tension you're having to sit on. Sit on your ankle, sit on this. It gives you some more of that, that height where now I have like almost no tension. I'm not having to support any weight. 
Then backpacks. Backpacks can do the same thing. So everybody tends to, the backpack ends up on the side, like not being used 90% of the time. And what I like to do is do something like this. Where now I can use the bag. I can do both. Yeah. I'm just filling that gap. And then again, this is one of those things now when I stand up or I change positions, the bag's on me. And again, this is something I'm gonna have on me anyways. And this, this can be put behind me, depending on what, how you need to change levels, whatever. The bag is a great tool that is really underutilized. Okay, so we talk different levels, talk slings, different methods. The rest is easy, clamp the gun in, turn, to, all the same things apply. Let's talk tripods as rear support. Because this te seems to be the thing that blows everybody's mind. So support off of something else. And let's say I have a window, I have a dresser, I have something else I can get the front of the gun on. The one thing people don't, don't think about is using the tripod as rear support. They're light, they're agile. That thing has no movement. I'm holding on a blade of grass at about 100. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get the gun into my shoulder and then I'm getting where I can clamp and grab the, the uh, tripod leg itself and the stock. Now you guys could probably zero these guns just like this. And I'm like in the most unstable position. I'm like bent over on a weird angle. I'm not standing, not kneeling, like the, the strangest angle of any, and you're damn near like prone out, you can barely move. You wanna try it? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, so if you try to get a nice wide base. And you're clamping. Yep, however I can grab this, this and this. All right. That's super stable. Right? Okay. You're off of a ladder on a bag with a tripod standing. That's awesome. I never would have guessed that either. Taylor? Taylor, you've done this, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sure Price has. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, like, same concept of good. dripping yeah. off the barricade, except in the back of the gun. Yeah, now the thing that everybody tries to do is this. They try to move the gun to the to the tripod. Move the tripod to the gun. These tripods are loose. Super loose. So if I was to ask him to change targets and go, hey, move from the head plates at 200 to that target with that we trued on, that we, what I would do is, I, yeah. See how he lifted the tripod, brought it with him, came back down. What people have a tendency to do is then try to start moving the gun. Leave the gun where it is. Move, move the tripod. Solid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through, I'm gonna set different stations, we're gonna have tripods at different levels, and then we're gonna shoot through this too. Um, as you guys move in and out of the different positions, people go, well, shooting off a ladder is stupid. It's like, no, stop thinking of it as a ladder, think of it as different levels that you could engage at. This could be a tree branch, it could be a truck bed, it could be an ATV, it could be, take your pick. It's a fucking flat position to shoot off of. So changing positions what i want you guys to do is not get too steady on one target in one position like the whole the the art of all of this is building your position quickly and so it's not like okay now I'm, now that i'm perfectly stable i'm going to stay here and shoot every target on the range no the the real the art in it is can i get stable quickly and take a shot so if you get in a position you're stable you hit a target change positions change something up come off the tripod, re change the sling up, move the tripod legs, do something else, set it down, readjust, because that's gonna be the art in this. It's not just gonna be like, hey, my dope's tracking and I've got, I'm super stable. Like, let me just hit ding all the targets out there. That's your return on investment is gonna be minimal in comparison to changing. So changing in and out of positions on this, what I like to do is I like to pull the gun out, move this and go straight back in. Just like you're gonna like in and out of a, 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 you're going through a threshold, you're doing something. So I've gone out, move bag, back in.
and then use all of those things we, uh, we were talking about. If you guys wanna use the bag, if you guys wanna use that pump pillow, whatever. If you guys wanna try to grab a tripod, we'll have leave a tripod over here. If you guys wanna try the tripod as rear support. There's nothing stopping you at any level. That's the nice thing. If I go from down here, take this out of the way, back on it. I didn't have to adjust anything. And they go, well, what if it's not perfectly stable? What if it's not perfectly stable? Those legs aren't adjusted perfectly. All I'm looking for is just so I can get the stop, the vertical movement gone. So, I mean, honestly, you could use this thing as a damn monopod if you really wanted to. It does the same thing. It doesn't give you the lateral stability necessarily, but what you're trying to do is take and just create a point of contact that is not your body on the back. Questions, comments, concerns. You missed almost all of it. Sorry. <laughs> you ever run a kill strap? So something that's connected, like so, like what you're doing with the uh, with the sling to the uh, to the rifle. Do you ever run one from the bipod down? Like how your other tripod has that little clip on it. You know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. You ever use that, or do you always find it better to run from the rifle down? Oh, you're talking about pulling yourself into the tripod? Yeah, like, like something like that. Like the kill strap comes down and you step into it. And it sucks the tripod down? Oh, Or yeah. do you find it better to just do it I've from never, the gun? I've never used one. I tend to use it from the gun. Got it. So it, for me, it's all about how fast I can set it up. And like we were talking about, some people really like to attach into their belt. And they're like, oh, it's QD. Oh, it's this. I'm like, well, that's great. I don't, if rounds come through a window, which I've had happen before, um, I don't want to be connected to a huge contraption of a tripod. Yeah. I want to be able to bail. And you... Don't take my word for it. Try both ways. I have both slings here. Absolutely. So you guys shoot, wrap it on the tripod leg, change the leg orientation. You guys will see, like everybody really likes having both. It's a, it's a very much a Marine thing from the schoolhouse. They, this is the only way you can ever shoot off a tripod. <laughs> I'm like, well, sometimes I like it like this because I like wrapping the tripod or the sling leg around and I tend to put some actual forward pressure on the gun when I shoot. And so, I don't necessarily need that recoil management because I'm the recoil management. So it's not like the gun. Now, again, 338 Lapua, you know, you're shooting a, a 50 off of it. Okay, I might want to give myself that repetitive recoil management. A 139556 gun, I'm not coming off target, rocking to the next county caused by recoil. <laughs> so neither of them are wrong. Neither, just try them both. Don't just take it as mantra of anybody, me or anybody else. Try them both, see what you like. I tend to, because of how I use a sling, I like to be more like this instead of more crossbody. So, let's go. Guys, grab your guns. We'll set up. Um, can we use your hog saddle? Yep, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Far target. Far target. Spot on. Impact, center mass on the bolt. Yeah, so uh, what you just saw was, uh, so the USPSA, you know, a three gun bullshit. All right, I'm not always my thing. Uh, this is my thing. Uh, and this gun I'm taking home. Okay, hey, center mass. Right on. Dead center. Many of six left of, uh, left of tower. Mini up left the tower. 1.6. On glass. Just over, just over. Engaging. Impact, dead center, far target. Far target. Impact. It's not just wind like left to right, as you lose the clock value, you you use a percentage of that wind hold. Right. So there's full value, no value. Yeah, right and then edge, typically you'd be like, well, what's between that? Well, it's half value. Well, it's not. You actually, you lose value really quickly only at the end. And like half, like a 45 degree ends up being like 75%. It's like 72. And so you're, you're like 80 to 90 is like between 45 degrees. Like here's our shooting. Between here and here is like 75 to 100. 
but from here, 75 to zero. So you have like 25% is like just off the right. So there's typically something out there. So the way you do a fast wind formula is you go in any kind of ballistic app and you start upping the miles an hour from zero, 90 degrees. What you're gonna do is you're gonna up that wind value until you get a 0.1 shift of wind at 100 in your ballistic app. And so what that's truing up is, is now for every one of, so let's say it's four miles an hour, five miles an hour, you're a five mile an hour, every five miles an hour at a hundred yards, it's 0.1. So what you do is, is now at 200, that would be 0.2, 300, that'd be 0.3, at 400, 0.4, et cetera, et cetera. So that's 0.4 at that, at 400 for every that many miles an hour. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. So at 500, let's say it's a five mile an hour gun, and so at 500, it's 0.5 every five miles an hour. And it's 20 miles an hour 15, wind, it'll be two. Yes. Right. That, and then, then you can take that and you, and then you add the, you take off the percentage on what direction it's from. Okay. That's the fat, that's your starting fast wind formula. It's a lot of quick math. Yeah. You, you do it enough, you get good at it. What I always used to do is wind, wind is linear in that way. You can think about it. And so if you remember stuff like, I always use a base wind. So if, hey, if I live someplace where it's really windy, that base wind might be 10. If I live someplace where it's like, oh, it's three gusting eight, I might use a five. Okay. And I go, hey, so I'll write down on my wrist coach or whatever, hey, what's five mile an hour wind? Or if I shoot the same gun a lot, like if I shoot that all the time, I'll, you'll start to memorize it. You go, hey, at 200, it's this, 400, this, 600, 800. And then you start doing fast math, right? Like you go, hey, it's 15. If I know what five miles an hour is, you, you triple it. Yeah. You know, hey, it's 15, but it's coming at 45. So it's 15 to 75% of that is this. That's what I start with. Okay. Smooth little go. Hold on, hold on. Oh, there we go, center mass, center yep. again. You on? I'm on. You just shot about, that was four rounds about this big. <laughs> That's fast, right? At five, 570 with a, camera? yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> with a 13.9? Yeah. That's fine, That's I'll awesome. take that one That's sick. On the third try. Look at that group. Oh, that's money. That's yours in the middle of that target. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's his last four rounds. Yeah, so oh, Jimmy's better me. than you in every way, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> what? Jimmy's better than you in every way. All right, let's go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm fucking better than all of you. <laughs> I wanna be like Taylor. Eat your fucking Wheaties. All right. Work out all the time. Never do cardio. And uh, eat red meat. So, uh, next time, you are on the right one. I'm in. Here we go. Yeah, that was go. it. Oh, that is so much better. That's what that Yeah. That's so money. That's so easy to walk through that. I mean, that's, that's three six inch plates between 200 and 270. And then an IPSC at whatever, 350 or whatever that one is. Yeah. Which one did you go to? This. One right above the target. Stand by, go! Sorry, 
Tripod, kneeling. Okay. Ip6, dude. Ip6. Oh, Ip6. Sorry. Pack, no idea. Are you shooting my dick right now? Looks like you're probably. 
probably off right head. Oh yeah, that was right off right edge. Come on, let's go, let's go! Back! Oh, do that, yeah. Get the archer going. Or maybe oh, I should... Uh oh. Or just move the whole tripod, why not? I'm gonna feel it out. Could be a really good idea. Shut up, Taylor. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Doesn't need a cheerleader. Ah, next target. Ah, next target. Re-engage, that was the post. Ah. Right, maybe go a little slower.
fuck! I'm dead. Let the record show that I beat Taylor. <laughs> that means I'm not last. <laughs> this is this is why I'm the uh, leader of the average Joes because I get on and fuck it up. So the USPSA, you know, a three gun bullshit. All right, I'm not always my thing. Uh, this is my oh, thing. So. Oh. Listen. Oh, <laughs> Sometimes in life, I'm time. just oh. you've got to Taylor. Be. Taylor is big mad right now. One because he lost, and two because of how he lost. He was so excited to come out here. And he just you have no idea. There was no bad. chance of anybody beating me. And I short load a mag. That's what happens. Listen. I'm not gonna blame me. I'm not gonna blame Jesus. I'm gonna blame Bruiser. It's oh, all, it's all my fault. Poor instruction today. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. It was poor instruction on my part. Was, uh, Although Jimmy, who just started shooting precision rifle, missed three times and shot in 255. Yeah, well, that's slower than dog shit. So. <laughs>and then you That's two, right, Price. Uh, top and bottom, left. I'm always page. a power bottom, top Jimmy. Bottom. What's up, dude? Preston got that so, dumpy. A tenth of Absolute a mil wagon. is a third of an MOA. He, he so had to get a yards, certified a uh, or commercial driver's license to pull this thing around. So you, that's our, okay, let's go. Let's go. We had time in Arizona. We were, uh, somebody forgot to dial down there two and a half minutes. That's a uh, Jimmy thing to do. Yeah. All right.